The Spirit is here among us, within us, around us, and between us. The Spirit is here to strengthen us, bringing courage in times of need. The Spirit is here to move us, calling us to sing and to praise. The Spirit of God is here. Please take your order of service, and we will read together responsively. Healing God, we come together in our brokenness. God of wholeness, make us whole. Restoring God, we come together in our emptiness. God of abundance, fill us up. Creator God, we come together a dazzling array of your creation. God, our creative spark, inspire us. Let us join together as we read our invocation, followed by the Lord's Prayer. God of peace, help us to relax. Take from us the tension that makes peace impossible. Take from us the distress that hides your joy. Help us to know that we are in your loving arms, morning, noon, and night. Through Jesus Christ, who taught us to pray, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, Hallowed be thy name, thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts, as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. Good morning, church. It's good to see everyone this morning. Thank you for coming today. It is so good to see you after such a long absence from our beautiful sanctuary. Our core belief is this, that no matter who you are or where you are on life's journey, that you are welcome here. Please be sure that you signed in upon entering It is important that we have an attendance list in case we need to contact Trace. 
We will not be passing offering plates for the foreseeable future, but there are donation boxes located near the exits. Just to take every precaution, the orders of worship have been printed over 48 hours ago, and after the service, please take your orders of worship uh, home with you. The bathrooms in the chapel narthex are available for use. However, as we try to keep all parts of our bu building safe for others, we ask that you restrict your activity to our sanctuary and our chapel. And following the service, we encourage you to greet one another on the patio, which is straight through the back doors. And also at 12 noon, uh, we encourage you to join us for our virtual fellowship time over Zoom. And if you need that uh, internet link, let us know and we will get that to you. For our prayers this week, we want to remember the family of Margaret George. Margaret died earlier this week in Ithaca, and she was 99 years old. Joanna Regis, Joanna is in Sands Point Rehab, and she would love a phone call if you are able. Uh, just call the rehab center and they will connect you directly to her room. And also we want to remember those who are suffering as a result of the wild, wildfires out west. So we will hold all of these in our thoughts and prayers this week. Our scripture lesson for today comes from the New Testament book of Luke, chapter 7, verses 12 through 15. As Jesus approached the gate of the town, a man who had died was being carried out. He was his mother's only son, and she was a widow. And with her was a large crowd from the town. When the Lord saw her, he had compassion for her and said to her, Do not weep. Then he came forward and touched the buyer, and the bearers stood still. And he said, Young man, I say to you, rise. The dead man sat up and began to speak, and Jesus gave him to his mother. In the reading of these words, may we hear the word of the Lord. Amen. Please take your order of service, and we will read responsibly. We are created in the image of God. We walk in the presence of God. We live surrounded by the love of God. The Spirit, let us pray to God. Compassionate God, Draw near to us as we draw near to you. Remind us that you love us as parents love their children. Remind us that your mercy is boundless and generous. Remind us that you beckon us always and will wait forever as we find our way back to you. Open our hearts to receive your compassion that we may be vessels of hope in our troubled world. Today we continue to pray for those suffering as a result of the wildfires on the West Coast. Strengthen the first responders that their efforts will be enough to contain and ultimately extinguish the fires. We are mindful that many of us gathered this morning have loved ones in California, Oregon, and Washington. Give them wisdom and courage to do whatever must be done to stay safe. We remember those suffering from viruses, from COVID-19 to HIV. May vaccines and cures be found to heal those suffering from these and maladies of every kind. And we remember those being mistreated because of their gender, their orientation, their skin color, their primary language, or their lack of resources. Be near these, we pray. Comfort the family of Margaret George, and we give you thanks for her many years on this earth. And we ask that you would strengthen Johanna Regis 
that she might be able to go home soon. Through the love of your eternal spirit, we pray. Amen. And now we will hear a wonderful cello solo from Gregory Stebbins. Everybody in here doesn't know Gregory. Gregory is someone who grew up in our church. We remember Gregory when he was shorter than a cello. And he's in Oregon working on a master's and has sent this to us and enjoy. So Lynn and Doug, please tell Gregory that we said that was amazing. And we'll look forward, he's coming home Christmas? Thanksgiving. Thanksgiving, all right. We got a space reserved right there. Bring us cello chair. When our son Matthew was in middle school, he asked me a tough question. Why, if God did all those great miracles back in biblical times, 
doesn't God do them today? I don't even recall what I told him, but I remember feeling that my answer was lacking. Hopefully I won't feel the same way at the end of today's sermon. It's important to note that Christ's miracles were always in response to human need. In the Bible, prior to several miracles are the words, Jesus is moved with compassion. In the book of Matthew, Jesus is twice moved with compassion when he sees the hungry without food. Later in the same book, he is moved with compassion and heals two blind men. In the book of Mark, Christ's compassion compels him to heal a man with leprosy. And in today's scripture, Jesus is moved with compassion upon meeting the grieving woman in Nain who had very recently lost her husband. In all of these stories, it is compassion that moved Jesus to action. For him, the miracles were compassion in action. Of course, that was 2,000 years ago. Why did God work miracles in biblical times but doesn't seem to today? There are several potential answers. First, we can follow the model of Thomas Jefferson, who didn't believe in any of the supernatural stories, including in the New Testament. He literally took a pair of scissors and snipped out the miracle stories of Jesus. After all, Jefferson was a deist who believed that God set the universe in motion and now just observes it all, unable or unwilling to get involved. If you like the image of God as a mere spectator, perhaps you should be a deist, but there are other options. Some scholars say that the miracles of Jesus and the apostles happen for a specific purpose at a specific time. For instance, Christ's miracles helped people believe that he was the Messiah. Miracles worked by the apostles served the function of helping launch the early church. These scholars argue that once the age of the apostles passed, and after the church was legalized and institutionalized under the Roman Emperor Constantine, that miracles were no longer needed. I don't find that particularly satisfying either. What I think is this, who's to say that God no longer works miracles? Just because I haven't witnessed spectacular miracles like those performed by Jesus does not mean they are no longer possible. Perhaps they still happen somewhere and I've just missed them. Even today, people take pilgrimages to Lourdes where some of them find healing of one sort or another. Perhaps there are miracles happening around us all the time and then we just don't appreciate them for the miracles they truly are. Is not life the greatest miracle of all? It's easy to think that people in Bible times who witness the miracles firsthand have a big advantage over us. It must have been so easy for his early followers. They didn't have to wonder if God existed because they saw Jesus and the other apostles work miracles. With their own two eyes, they saw Jesus feed the 5,000. Who wouldn't believe after seeing such things? But the surprising truth is that not everyone who saw the miracles believed that they were of divine origin. Skeptics saw them and thought they were a hoax. Seeing miracles does not automatically equal faith. Consider for a moment the Exodus story, where Moses led the Israelites out of Egyptian slavery. The Israelites believed beyond the shadow of a doubt 
that God caused the ten plagues that eventually persuaded Pharaoh to relent and set the people free. And you all know how I feel about God and the plagues, but that's a different story. The Israelites believed beyond the shadow of a doubt that God parted the Red Sea to save them from the fast approaching Egyptian army. From a miracle perspective, the Israelites saw one after another, manna from heaven, springs of water in the middle of the desert, a cloud to guide them by day, a pillar of fire to guide them by night. They saw all of these miracles, and yet they were not known to be a people of great faith. They were known to be a people who constantly complained and wondered out loud, what has God done for me lately? Case in point, the Israelites were camped out at the foot of Mount Sinai while Moses climbed up to commune with God. Having no time frame for his return, the Israelites quickly gave up on Moses. Instead of staying true to the God who liberated them from bondage in Egypt, the Israelites forced Aaron, brother of Moses and high priest, to help them fashion a golden calf to worship. Despite all of the miracles they had seen, the Israelites turned their backs on God in order to worship a statue, a mere idol. Seeing God's miracles firsthand didn't help the Israelites keep the faith in the absence of their leader, Moses, who of course eventually came down from the mountain carrying the first set of the Ten Commandments. The people had seen plenty of miracles, but that didn't stop them from abandoning their miracle-working God. What constitutes a miracle anyway? Frederick Buechner writes, a cancer inexplicably cured, a voice in a dream, a statue that weeps, a miracle is an event that strengthens faith. It is possible to look at most miracles and find a rational explanation in terms of cause and effect. Faith in God is less apt to proceed from miracles than miracles from faith in God. Witnessing miracles firsthand does not guarantee a lasting faith. Besides, I like to think that Jesus had us in mind when he said, blessed are those who have not seen and yet believe. So what are we to make of the miracles or the lack thereof today? The only word that answers the question for me is mystery. Mystery with a capital M. Mystery with a capital M means that God is a mystery. Mystery with a capital M means that we don't know definitely and can't say for sure, but that's okay. As humans, do we really think that we can understand all of the intricacies of our unfathomable God? Not a chance. My deepest conviction is this. I will never say what God can or cannot do. Just because I've not seen a miracle of biblical proportion does not mean that it is impossible. No one can say definitively what God can or cannot do. It's all a matter of faith. It's all a holy mystery, capital H, capital M. Without question, I believe that God works through the wonders of modern medicine to heal people today, but not everybody gets healed. 
nor did Jesus heal all of the sick people in ancient Israel. Statistically, he only healed a handful. However, if I am to believe in a loving God, then I believe in a God who does whatever is possible within the limitations of life. One of my seminary professors, Dr. Frank Tupper, lost his young wife to cancer. When his daughter asked him why God healed other people but not her mom, Dr. Tupper answered, God would have if God could have. When asked if God could do the impossible, Dr. Tupper said, no, by definition, God cannot do the impossible. No one can. God can only do the possible. Another of my professors, Dr. Glenn Henson, used to compare life to a chess match and God to a chess master. As humans, we make a choice and make our move on life's chessboard. After we've done so, there are a finite number of moves that God can make in response. In making particular moves, we limit the number of counter moves our opponent can make. And this, Dr. Henson would say, is the reason we pray. Perhaps prayer opens up a move on the chessboard of life that would not have been possible otherwise. It's all a matter of faith. Where one person sees a miracle, another person sees the luck of the draw. Frederick Buechner says that Christians aren't better than anyone else. They just know who to thank. Besides our ability to put compassion into action is no small miracle in and of itself. Amen. And now may love bless you and keep you. May it flow through you to others and flow through others to you. Be safe, be well, be kind. Go in peace. Amen.